Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 16 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. In lecture 14 and lecture 15, we have discussed about primarily about the equations which govern the process of wave propagation. In lecture 14, we have discussed about primary wave passing through an elementary rod. In lecture 15, we have discussed about propagation of shear wave through a particular medium, how the propagation is governed by the equations which are actually representing the characteristics primarily the mass density as well as the stiffness of the medium. Now, whenever it comes to uh, using the ground motion record for design purpose, primarily we will be interested to know how much the characteristics of ground motions have been altered by a particular medium. To elaborate further on this particular part, we can see over here, suppose somewhere here there was an earthquake. As a result of this particular earthquakes, waves have been generated including primary wave, secondary wave. Once these waves reach to the recording station, so here is a recording station. You can see over here. So, this is your recording station. Recording station, you can have a rotating drum kind of, you can have piezoelectric one where which will sense based on the vibration, there will be movement in the piezoelectric component and that will detect how much will be the vibration in the ground. So, what will happen because of this wave propagation? propagation of seismic waves, primarily we will be focusing about what is happening at a site. Now, when we say one particular terminology as site, we are interested where recording station is located or a building is located or any other infrastructure which is about to come or any other infrastructure such that we are interested either if you talk about recording station, we are interested to know what is the characteristics of ground motion which has been recorded by this particular recording station. When we are talking about the building, we will be discussing about whenever this kind of earthquake which is potential to happen in a particular region, what is the external loading, what is the seismic loading your building or any other infrastructure, infrastructure is going to experience seismic loading that will be applied to the structure. Now, in order to ensure that the structure remains safe during a particular earthquake loading, we have to make sure that this kind of seismic loading which is going to be implemented on a particular structure, the structure is going to respond <coughs> such that the deflection and other parameter which are governing the response of the structure should remain within permissible limit. So, as far as recording station is concerned, it is going to sense the vibration, but if you see the overall understanding about the problem definition or the physical characteristics of the problem. So, here is the focus from where the seismic energies have been released, seismic energy has been released from here and then by means of waves which are actually propagating in three dimensional space all around from your point of origin, wherever it is interacting it will come into medium interaction which I have discussed in earlier lectures also. So, between the focus and your site of interest, there will be lot of heterogeneity which are present in the medium. Some of these we have already discussed when we were discussing about attenuation of seismic waves between the source and the site, including heterogeneity which are present in the medium, including energy which will be redistributed by means of heat by scattering. So, finally, whatever energy seismic waves are carrying and reaching a particular site of interest, again at a particular site, there is bedrock which is present at which primarily the incident wave will be reaching. 
Now, between the bedrock and the surface, so bedrock means it will be located at certain depth unless it is an outcrop motion. The bedrock will be located at certain depth and between the bedrock and the surface there will be n number of number of soil layers. Most of the time when we are laying our foundation, we often lay our foundation in soil medium. This is generally encountered, but at times you can also encounter hard strata available at shallower depth. Primarily because the waves are incidented over here at this particular location and here onward we have discussed whether it was primary wave or it was shear wave. We have discussed like depending upon the characteristics of each of these layers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, total we are seeing in this particular example like total 5 layers are there. Depending upon the characteristics of each of these layers will govern how much particle oscillation between the bottom to the top of first layer will happen whether it is because of primary wave, if it is secondary wave how much shearing is happening or angular displacement is happening. Same way once it reaches to the top of layer 1 it will be the bottom of layer 2 and then again depending upon the stiffness and mass density of the medium you can again see how much change because considering the stiffness which each of these layers are offering it is going to change the characteristics of vibration, characteristics of incident waves. So, if you are talking about layer number 1 which is the bottom most layer there will be some incident wave, there will be some frequency content, duration and amplitude associated to that frequency content or the vibration which is incident over here. Depending upon the medium characteristics, the medium will offer some stiffness or resistance as a result of which between this particular layer. So, if you zoom in, this is layer number 1 having some value of constraint modulus, Young's modulus, shear modulus, mass density, Poisson's ratio that is going to define if this is my incident wave. That means there is some frequency content or if I put some recording station related data, some frequency content of the motion is there. When this wave is interacting this particular layer which is also composed of number of particles and overall the material is also having some stiffness value and density values. What will happen? The material will start responding to this loading whether it is by means of to and fro motion by means of shearing as a result when this particular motion will be transferred from here to the top of the layer, top of layer 1. Remember this is not the top of overall stratification, this is not surface, this is top of this particular soil layer. The characteristics of the motion between these two stratifications between the bottom of the same layer and the top of the same layer that will significantly change. So, we will discuss about this particular part which is primarily change in the frequency content, amplitude and duration or change in ground motion characteristics, ground motion characteristics between the surface and the bottom of the same layer between the top and the bottom of a soil layer which is primarily a function of stiffness and other properties of the soil layer. The reason why we are interested to know about the material properties that is constraint modulus, Young's modulus, shear modulus is because of inherent properties of each of these soil layer, there will be change in the frequency content, there will be change in the duration, amplitude of the wave or the frequency content or the vibrations which is incident from propagation path. Now, same exercise of change in the ground motion characteristics will happen for layer number 2, then 3, 4 and subsequently for 5. So, if you are talking about designing a building or any other infrastructure 
Similarly, if you are talking about the vibration which will be detected by a recording station at the ground surface, as per this particular picture, vibration which was incidented at this level and the vibration which are being detected by the recording station or are governing the response of your infrastructure will be significantly different. In other ways, if I am interested to design a particular building on the ground surface, I should be knowing how much change in the vibration which reached to my site, but still at bedrock level has happened because of all these layers which are present between the bedrock and the surface as a result of which now I will be getting a modified ground motion. I will not be getting the same ground motion which was incident at the level at the bottom of this particular layer, but some modified ground motion. And if I am able to find out this particular modified ground motion, that means I am able to get an idea about seismic loading which my structure, building, dam, bridge, slope is expected to experience because of this modification primarily because of local soil which are available near the ground surface. So, primarily one thing which will come into picture here is local site effect. We will discuss about what is local site effect in next class, but in a nutshell you can see local site effect means modification in characteristics of incident characteristics of incident motion by means of by means of propagation medium characteristics, propagation medium properties. So, two properties are there, one is ground motion properties or characteristics which are actually incidented and the second one is the medium through which the wave is propagating as it is moving from bottom to the top of each of these soil layers. Subsequently, after lot of such phenomena getting repeated between bedrock and the surface, finally you will get modified ground motion. So, this modification which is happening primarily at the site because of the soil which is available beneath the ground surface that is called as local site effect by means of properties of propagation medium. In earlier lectures, we have discussed about when the wave is passing through a particular elementary rod, when primary wave is there, what is the equation which is governing the propagation of wave through that particular medium, where the particle oscillation is also in the direction of wave propagation. But at the same time, we, when we were discussing about primary wave, we also discussed that in general primary wave is useful for detection of threshold values of seismic loading. It can be in terms of different different parameters, but certainly we are using primary waves so that one can understand a deadly earthquake related seismic wave is about to hit an infrastructure and when seismic wave primarily the shear wave is going to hit your infrastructure, there will be development of shear stresses, the material will undergo shear deformation then there can be chances of failure, there can be chances of liquefaction and so on and so forth. So, the objective of deriving the primary wave equation was to find out how to, how to get the value of primary wave velocity. Similarly, we also derived the governing equation for shear wave velocity. Now, considering loading point of view or from the objective like we are interested to quantify what is local side effect or what is the modification which is being done to the input ground motion which is the motion at the bed of each layer to the top of that particular layer, we have to have an understanding about the governing equation. Equation means at each of these soil layers, soil layer 1, how the displacement value or velocity or acceleration values are going to change as we move within the soil layer from one point to other point. This is with respect to space, 
because we are talking about dynamic loading condition. So, there will be change in terms of time as well. That means, right now if I consider here itself a particular point of observation, how this particular point the displacement is changing with respect to time when some incident wave is applied at the bottom of this particular soil layer. Same way you can transfer to other point, other point, other point. Overall for each particular point, how the motion with respect to space and with respect to time is changing that is going to give me how much modification in my incident wave motion which can also be considered as maybe some plot of displacement time history or acceleration time history. That means, how with respect to time the displacement or the acceleration or the velocity values have changed because now the motion due to seismic loading has been applied to the bottom of that layer. So, this is incident motion and then subsequently this motion at each of these location will keep on changing. So, the, the when we say about the solution of one dimensional equation of motion, basically we are interested to find out the governing equation based on which I will be able to determine what is the value of displacement at each of the position at any point within the soil mass that means with respect to space and at any moment of time that means before earthquake loading, during earthquake loading or at the end of earthquake loading how much is the displacement values or how much displacement in the particle has happened because of incident wave because when this incident wave reaches to the bedrock again some component will be traveling towards uh, I mean through these particular soil layers. So, in order to find out the solution basically we are interested to find out the response of each soil layer to external loading, external loading by seismic waves. More specifically here we will be discussing about S waves because primarily it has been observed that shear waves causing more modification which is important as far as the response of the building and other infrastructure is concerned. So, we will be discussing about the one dimensional equation of motion primarily for shear wave. We have already determined one dimension equation of motion. Now, in today's class, we will be discussing about the solution of this one dimensional equation of motion for shear wave. So, let us put the heading as solution to one dimensional equation of motion. Here I want to repeat once more that when we say about equation of motion that that means the equation which is correlating the displacement value with respect to space and time with respect to material properties. When we say about the solution basically we will be interested to know how much change in the displacement characteristics across your medium of interest has happened with respect to space with respect to time because it is dynamic loading condition. So, one solution to one dimensional equation of motion for shear wave. So, here if you remember based on earlier discussion, based on earlier discussion more specifically related to lecture. Fifteen, which was the lecture just before this particular lecture, the governing equation of motion the governing equation of motion so you can refer to lecture 15 in the end of this particular lecture before we discuss about some numerical problem the governing equation of motion for S wave is 
the governing equation of motion for S wave is dou square theta over dou T square equals V P equals V S square because this is for shear wave V S square and dou square theta over dou X square. Now, this is the equation which was given in terms of theta which if we remember lecture 15 it was angular displacement by angular displacement because when shear wave is passing through the medium, the medium will undergo horizontal as well as vertical displacement simultaneously and that is how we have approximated it to application of torque in the direction perpendicular to the wave propagation. Because of this torque there will be angular displacement though particle will be moving along the circumference, but the measurement of movement of the particle we have done in terms of theta which was angular deformation. Again if we want to see on that particular element like if, if we consider maybe this particular length of the material which was considered as dx elementary length. So, this is again still as u that means the linear displacement along the circumference in which the position of the particle has changed from here to here or you can say more specifically from here to here the particle position or the, the, the initial position of the particle has shifted from position 1 to position 2 because the particle is subjected to torque and this was given as theta that is angular deformation and if you see again in the in this particular view. So, basically we are trying to find out here this is the value of theta which is representation of the value of u happening along the circumference and this is the value of r. So, in general we can see over here that the value of theta. So, u is along the circumference theta is the value which is measured radially and r is the value of radius with respect to the surface, the radius of this cylindrical rod. So, here we can also see the value of theta can be defined over here as u over r considering the value of torque is relatively smaller. So, you can approximate over here where u is particle displacement along the circumference or along the surface of the rod along the surface of the rod r is the radius of the rod and theta is angular displacement which is already told over here. So, based on this now here in this particular equation which is given as equation number 1 we can see the value of theta has been partially differentiated twice once with respect to t that is time and second time with respect to x also. So, based on this particular equation where theta is given as u over r we can determine theta equals to u over r where u is particle displacement measured along the circumference r is the radius of that elementary rod. So, based on this we can get the value of dou a square theta over dou t square as 1 over r dou a square u over dou t square. Similarly, On one side we are having dou square theta over dou t square, other side we are having dou square theta over dou x square which can be also determined as 1 over r dou square u over dou x square. Keeping both these terms putting the values of values of dou square theta over dou t square and dou a square theta over dou x square from above 
into equation 1, one can get. So, what you can get over here? Do square u over do t square equals v s square do square u over do x square. This is still be called as one dimensional equation of motion, one d equation of motion of motion for S wave in terms of displacement, displacement u. So, this is one dimensional equation of motion still we are on the equation of motion we have not moved to the solution of this particular equation. So, when we are interested to find out the solution we will be using this particular equation. So, dou square u over dou t square equals v s square dou square u over dou x square. Now, in order to solve in order to solve governing equation of motion, governing equation of motion we can use help of we can take help of method of variable separable. variable separable. Before going to this particular method of variable separable, what we can do? U which is defining the motion of the particle with respect to space as well as with respect to time, because when loading is applied the particle can the particle can undergo deformation which is changing with respect to space as well as with respect to time. So, I am considering u as one is with respect to space and second with respect to time. So, q is function with respect to space function of u with respect to with respect to space and t function of u with respect to with respect to time. So, I am considering that though u was combined function I am considering that u is you can be separated into two parts one which is looking after the variation with respect to space other one with respect to time. Now, in our basic equation we had dou square u over dou x square and dou square u over dou t square which were correlated by means of v s square. So, using this particular equation you can determine dou square u over dou t square equals to q dou square t over dou t square. This is double differentiation of u which is given in this particular equation with respect to t partially. Similarly, dou square u similarly dou square u over dou x square equals t dou square q over dou x square. Now, keeping both put the values of dou square u over dou x square let this be equation 3 and dou square u over dou t square this is let it be 
in the same order do a square x and then t from equation 2 and 3 in you can call this as 1 prime because 1 we had given and now we have moved to equation 2 and 3 so 1 prime in 1 prime what you will get q times dou square t over dou t square equals v s square t times dou square q over dou x square. If you go with separating separating by variable separable one can get so you can see this is with respect to time this is with respect to space so what we can do is 1 over t do a square t over dou t square equals v s square over q dou a square q over dou x square. Assume this particular thing as minus of omega square assume that means if you take this particular part with respect to this part you will get dou a square t over dou t square plus t times omega square equals to 0 this is one equation and second equation is dou a square q over dou x square plus q omega a square over v a square equals 0. So, that means in first you have taken these two things and you will get this equation in second you will get these two things and then you will get this particular equation. So, in total you are having two equations. So, as far as first equation is concerned that is dou square t over dou t square plus t times omega a square equals to 0 this is from this equation we can compare and find out the characteristic equation characteristic equation of this linear equation we can find out the characteristic equation will be equals to lambda square plus omega square equals to 0 indicating lambda equals to plus minus iota omega. Now, if that is the case the solution will be the solution will be remember this is the attempt to solve the equation which was having only function varying with respect to time. So, here the solution will be the value of t which can be determined as c times cosine omega t plus d times sin of omega t. Let this particular equation be given as number 5 and the equation which were given over here these two equations let these be the part of equation number 4 both these equations. So, equation 4 are having basically one is with respect to time one with respect to space both are linear equations. So, first we have taken with respect to time the linear equation try finding out the characteristic equation and then based on the characteristic equations functional form we try finding out the solution. So, that we have got lambda equals to plus minus iota omega and then the solution corresponding to 
T which is representing the part of U which is representing variation with respect to time and this is the equation. Now consider the second part. Now considering second part of second part or second equation 4 that means dou square q over dou x square plus q omega square over v s square equals to 0. In this particular equation again one can determine similar to this particular equation the characteristic equation will be equation will be delta equals to plus minus iota omega over V s. Everywhere we are writing V s because we are trying to find out the solution when shear wave is passing through a particular medium how the particle displacement throughout your medium of interest will happen with respect to space, with respect to time. Now, if we got the characteristic equation, the solution of this particular part, the solution for this part, why I am telling this part? Because this is not the complete solution. Complete solution is when we get the solution for u, which is actually the particle oscillation, particle displacement with respect to space and time. So, that will be the final equation. Right now, we are having one equation which is giving you how the variation is taking place with respect to time and this particular equation which is uh, the solution for q which was the function with respect to space. The solution for this equation will be that means the solution is for q will be equals to a cos omega over v s times x plus v sin omega over V s x. So, this is one particular equation I have given as 6. Equation 5 gives you the particle displacement variation with respect to time. Equation 6 gives you the particle displacement with respect to space and once you know the value of once the components of components of u with respect to space, respect to space that means q and with respect to time that is t are known. u can be determined, u is particle motion, the actual solution of the entire equation was dependent on u. If you see the one dimensional equation of motion for shear wave, now it was changed to in terms of u value. So, this is u will be equals to q times t. Now, we have the value of q and you have the value of t. Let, let us write those both the equations separately in the next slide. So, u can be written now as we are having two equation that is first one is a cos omega over v s x plus b sin omega over v s x. This is with respect to q and then that means Okay, so, A and B are the coefficient values for Q and C D are the coefficient values for T. Then C cos omega T plus D sin omega T. So, this is the complete solution for U. We will solve it further. You can get A cos omega over V s times x 
C will also come over here and then cos of omega t plus A d cosine of omega over V s times x and sin of omega t plus B times C sin omega over V s x cos omega t plus B d sin omega over V s x sin omega t. Now, here we will make another assumption that is assume omega over V s equals to k small k which is representing wave number. So, omega over V s I am again modifying with respect to k wave number or this refers to k refers to number of complete waves number of complete wave cycles in unit meter that means within 1 meter how many number of cycles depending upon the operating frequency are able to complete that will define how much is your wave number. So, accordingly this is one assumption second so you can extend it further again consider A c equals to small p, A d equals to q, B c equals to r and B d equals to small s. Hence, this particular equation which was given for u can be modified as p cos k x cos omega t plus q cos k x sin omega t plus r sin k x cos omega t plus s sin k x sin omega t. This is the equation I am considering this as equation number 7. Now, again in equation number 7 let us consider make some more assumptions let us consider tan of tangent of omega t equals to m over q which indicates that q sin omega t will be equals to m cos omega t. Similar way tan of k x is considered as n over r which indicates r sin k x equals to n cos k x. So, again in uh, let uh, use these values q sin omega t which is given here then r sin k x which is given here replacing this with the updated terms we will get p cos k x cos omega t plus m times cos omega t cos k x plus n times cos k x cos omega t 
प्लस एस टाइम साइन के एक्स साइन ओमेगा टी सो हेयर एक्चुअली नाउ इफ यू सी ईच टर्म अर्लियर वॉज हैविंग कॉस एंड साइन कॉम्पोनेंट इन टू टर्म्स विच नाउ हैव बीन कन्वर्टेड टू कॉस टर्म्स सो इफ यू सी इन टर्म वन टर्म टू टर्म थ्री इट्स ऑनली कंसिस्टिंग ऑफ कॉस के एक्स कॉस ओमेगा टी सो इफ आई से पी प्लस एम प्लस एन कॉस के एक्स कॉस ओमेगा टी प्लस एस साइन ऑफ के एक्स साइन ऑफ ओमेगा टी दिस इज द वैल्यू ऑफ यू विच इज इंडिकेटिंग द पार्टिकल डिस्प्लेसमेंट विद रेस्पेक्ट टू स्पेस विद रेस्पेक्ट टू टाइम अगेन इफ यू कंसिडर यू If you consider p plus q, p plus m plus n equals e plus f, and s equals to e minus f, we can determine u equals to e plus f times cos kx cos omega t plus e minus f sin kx sin omega t which can further be simplified as u equals to e times cos omega t minus kx plus f times of cosine omega t plus kx so now we are having the displacement value this is particle displacement because of shear wave propagating through the medium given as combined effect of variation with respect to time and with respect to space both in terms of cosine terms so equation 8 we can number this particular equation as equation number 8 we can call it as equation number 8 is the solution of one dimensional equation of motion for shear wave passing through the medium what it means if there is incident wave if i know the characteristics of incident wave using this particular equation i should be able to determine with respect to space at h equals to 0 or at x equals to 0 at x equals to the thickness of that particular layer in that particular range from time t equals to 0 to time of interest or the time up till which the duration of external loading is available with us one can determine how much modification in the ground motion will happen by means of the medium through which the shear wave is propagating so that what what i am trying to highlight here is if this is the incident wave having some ground motion characteristics using particular equation that is equation number 8 i will be able to determine how much vibration which is incident at this particular level that is 
bottom of layer 1, how much this vibration will be propagating or how much modification in the same vibration will happen from bottom to top of layer 1. So, this is modification in the vibration at layer 1, definitely the frequency content will be changing. Using this particular equation, once we will be discussing about the role of each soil layer, how to quantify it as, as I discussed in the beginning of based on quantification of local side effect, we will be able to determine how much modification in the frequency content of the motion will be able to happen between the bottom and top of one soil layer with known properties and known input ground motion characteristics. And once that part is over because this value is also a function of the strength or the stiffness properties of the medium. So, those properties will also come into mind when we will discuss about the modification in the ground motion between the bottom to the top of that particular soil layer. If there are more than one layer, then the same exercise of modification of ground motion between the bottom to the top of that layer, we keep on doing such that the motion will be able to transfer from the bottom of the lowermost layer or the bedrock to the topmost layer or to the ground surface, where one is going to construct a building, building related foundation or any kind of other infrastructure. If recording is station is there, then recording station will also detect that modified ground motion, not the motion which is actually being transferred at the bedrock level from the site of interest. So, thank you everyone. With this, uh, I will close lecture 16 of this particular uh, course. When we will meet for lecture 17, we will continue this particular solution and try to find out how the modified ground motion one can evaluate for different different characteristics of soil properties. Thank you. Mm -hmm.